Hey, how's it going, everybody? In this video, I'm going to be reviewing two short stories by Robert Silverberg. The first one being Project Pendulum, which I gave a five out of five, and The Time Hoppers, which I gave a four out of five. So this book, Kronos, is a collection of three short stories by Robert Silverberg, each one ranging from about 100 pages to 150 pages. So they're kind of not necessarily like short stories, more like short novels, really. And it has to do with time travel. And I'm fascinated by time travel. Um, I really enjoy sci-fi in general, but time travel just seems to hold a special place, special niche uh, for when I seek out sci-fi stories or sci-fi movies, because I love learning about the possibility of it, the different ways it could happen, um, whether it's entirely possible or not, and especially the paradoxes that come with it. If you try to go back in time to change something, does it change the present that you came from? Or by you going back in time to try to change something, do you end up causing it to happen in the first place? <clears throat> so with Project Pendulum, I gave a uh, five out of five. Um, I think I read it within like 24 hours. It was like a hundred pages and it just, I just flew right through it. It was, it was so easy to, to get into. And what that one's about is, uh, two twin brothers have been, um, chosen, but they volunteered to be the first time travelers. <clears throat> and it's not just a simple press of a button and we're going to zap you to a certain time period. Um, the reason it's called project pendulum is because they need two people who are similar in mass, same size, basically, um, in order for it to work. Because if one person is, say, I don't know, 200 pounds, the other person is 150 pounds, that weight difference would cause the time travel properties to not balance properly. So it's essential that they used twins who are the same size, same, obviously same age, um, as a starting point because they've never done this before. So one twin, they start off in the same area, same time period, same spatial place. But each time, I forget the exact number, but it's something like, you know, it's like 9.5 to the times 10 to the whatever, like exponent, whatever um, minutes. So one will go... I'll just, I'll just use like a round number, like 10 years. So they'll go, um, or they start off in minutes. So like 10 minutes into the future. And then the other one will go 10 minutes in the past. And then the other one will go, it will switch and they'll go 10 minutes in the future, 10 minutes in the past. So they'll go, they'll like trade places basically. And then that exponent keeps rising so that they, the, the pendulum, uh, keeps increasing and decreasing the amount of time into the past, into the future that they, um, go into. And, um, eventually down the line, you know, time travel becomes a more regular thing as they jump at the farthest is like 95 million years into the future. One, one of the twins is really interested in what that would look like. And the other one is like a paleontologist. So he was really interested in seeing like what the dinosaurs would be like. So he really wanted to go 65 million years into the past. Uh, so the story basically just follows them jumping between these different time periods. They don't know when the next jump is going to happen, but each time they jump, it's a different time period, but also their spatial placement is different. So like if I were to jump a minute in the future, I'm sitting right here, but then I might be back here, um, you know, a minute in the future, just because of, you know, it's, it's not completely accurate. This is the first time that they're trying it. So as they jump through these different time periods, especially in the future, time travel becomes a more established thing. And when they go into the future, there are people like, Oh, you're the first time traveler. We've been expecting you, you know, welcome, you know, that type of thing. They don't stay in that time period for too long, but, uh, they get to see 65 million, you know, 95 million years into the past and into the future, which is, it was a really cool concept. And 
um, kind of toyed with the fact with the possibility of like, well, I'm in the past and I'm in the future now. Can I change anything, you know, type of thing. But what's really interesting about Robert Silverberg's writing is that I think I've, I think I mentioned this about some other author on my channel before. I don't rem exactly remember who it is, but he's not like overly descriptive with his, um, like his environments and stuff. He's a, he's a very, he's a great storyteller, but kind of like a coloring book. He's, he gives you the outline of like the story and then you can use your mind to populate the rest of those details. Like, so he might say they walked into a hundred story building, you know, with this at the front door and whatever, but he, he's not like describing every single detail of the environment that they're in. So, um, it's really easy for you to use your own imagination as to what, you know, the world looks like. He's not telling you like, this is exactly what it's supposed to look like. Um, he lets you fill in those details. Um, so Project Pendulum was a, and, and, and another interesting thing about his time travel stories, these, there's three in here and I read two of them. Um, the other one I started briefly. Um, but what's interesting about his stories is that they seem to end on a, happy note. Usually if you watch like a time travel movie, there's always some kind of disaster that happens at the end where, like I mentioned earlier, if you try to go back in time and change something, you end up being the one that causes the thing that you're trying to prevent, or you accidentally change something, uh, irrevocably or not, um, not irrevocably, but like you goofed it up past the point of, you know, no return. Um, so far, without giving away too many details, Project Pendulum and Time Hoppers, they seem to have like a, you know, d no disasters really have happened at the end of the stories, which is really unusual, I think, for time travel because usually it, there's some kind of uh, like, like a, a bad ending, so to speak. Um, so Project Pendulum, I give five out of five. Um, the Time Hoppers is another time travel story. And that one is about um, in the future, it's, it's like year 2400 or 2500, something like that. And the world has become immensely overpopulated to the point where if you have multiple people in the room, you have, there's a switch in the room that'll allow more oxygen to get into the room. Or if you, uh, like say there's like four people in the room and then three people leave. So the only one you want to close that oxygen switch so that you're not using excess oxygen, right? So there's so many people in the world that space is overcrowded and um, it's it's just a huge problem. So what is happening in this story is people um, are jumping back in time, hundreds of years, you know, it spans like hundreds to like maybe like a thousand years or 2000 years into the past where the world isn't as crowded and populated as it is nowadays. But the problem with that is when you send people back, whatever they do in the past changes the future. So, um, the, the main character in this story is like a, like a time cop basically, where he's trying to get to the bottom of who is sending these people back in time. And that's the way that this guy is making his living. The, the guy who's sending people back in time. And, um, because they have a list, this, this, this time cop has a list of names of people who have jumped back into the past and what year they're going. So they're trying to get, they're trying to catch the guy who's sending these people back in the past by saying, all right, we have a record of someone planning to jump three weeks from now. So we're going to monitor him, follow his movements and see where he goes because there's a record of him landing in 1975 or something like that. And, uh, the, the, the paradox, which I love thinking about is that they can't prevent him from jumping because there's already, a, there's already a record of him going into the past and the potential consequences of preventing someone from actually time hopping would be catastrophic. Even, even preventing one person from jumping, because you don't know, like if you, if you send someone back in time a hundred years you might be a descendant of that person, but you don't know it. You don't know what the potential consequences are of 
preventing someone from jumping into the past. So if like you were speaking to someone, they jumped into the past and they, and you ended up being a descendant of theirs because they went back in time and got married and had kids. What would the consequences be of you saying, no, you're going to stay in the present. Would you just disappear? What would happen? You know? So it's, it's this cool struggle between, uh, trying to catch the person who's sending them back in time, but not being able to actually prevent that time travel from happening because you don't know what the consequences would be. Um, so that one was also very, um, interesting. So Robert Silverberg is, you know, like, like, um, like project pendulum, he's a great storyteller. And this one doesn't have like an over an over like population of, of, uh, de- you know, details, and he lets you fill in those, those extra details. So that one I gave a four out of five. And, um, so both of those are really fun reads and it actually prompted me as soon as I read, uh, um, the first one, project pendulum, it prompted me to go out and buy more Robert Silverberg, um, short story collections. I don't know if he is exclusively short story. I think he's got novels, but I think the number of short stories outnumbers the number of novels that he has. Um, and you know, it's these, these huge collections that I'm getting, you know, they're $5, $6. Like you can't, you just can't beat that. So Robert Silverberg, the book of skulls, night wings, dying inside. This one sounds more like it's like sci-fi, but kind of more like a horror thing. This is like more hard sci-fi and he does a really great job of outlining those paradoxes that I'm talking about. Well, what are, you know, what are the possibilities and what are the consequences of doing things like that? So that one, and then this one, World of a Thousand Colors. That's just a cool name. So each one of these, the trend seems to be that there are three, let's call them like short novels in in, in each of these. And um, he seems to be entirely a sci-fi writer, but um, with, you know, with, with a little bit of expansion there, like this one's sci-fi, but kind of seems like more like scary or horror based. So, um, I would, I would recommend reading Robert Silverberg because I just happened to take a chance on, on this collection and thoroughly enjoyed everything that I've read by him so far. And, uh, if you've been wanting to dip your toes in sci-fi or short novels, uh, this would probably be a good place to start. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next book review video. See you later.